The reason why Chinese women take the same photos. When it comes to Instagram, you'd better not believe your eyes. Well, it looks like the last word in luxury might just be a carefully airbrushed illusion masterfully delivered through trickery, shared resources, and cold calculating strategy. Nobody in the world does this better than the husband hunting social climbers of China's rich girl WeChat groups. Why are so many girls taking the same photos with the same poses at the same locations? Are these girls really actually rich? In China, as well as other parts of the world, cons are specifically targeted at celebrities. Celebrities sometimes carry on full relationships with people who aren't what they seem. With how easily it is to connect with celebrities on different social media platforms, they're more vulnerable now than ever. For Chinese women who want to live the luxe life, Snagging a rich husband or celebrity is the easiest way to upgrade their life. It allows them to live in the lap of luxury. For many girls, playing elaborate tricks is simply the price of getting their prince charming. And he doesn't understand the scope of the game until he puts a ring on it. For 500 yen or less than 100 US dollars, aspiring socialites can join super secret WeChat groups that act as training grounds for getting a husband with deep pockets. The groups go by names such as Shanghai Female Socialite and Young Fashion Money. The girls in these WeChat groups don't mince any words about their end goal. It's the dark side of the fake it till you make it crowd. These groups are essentially rich husband training camps. They help girls through the proper steps needed to score a celebrity or rich husband. Since celebrities' lives are fully public, people can easily target them with lonely heart schemes or hard luck stories. The first step to look rich is to manufacture the right look for a rich girl. The plastic surgery-fueled influencer look is a booming industry with Chinese millennials and Chinese Gen Z. It's a huge industry estimated to be around 200 billion renminbi industry for 2020, or roughly 30.6 billion US dollars. Forecasts see a 50% growth in the industry to 47.7 billion US dollars by 2023. And of course, the vast majority who go under the knife are women. The influencer look is simple. Large eyes, prominent nose, narrow jawline, and flawless wrinkle-free skin. Across China, the luminous smiling influencers look almost exactly the same. The internet celebrity face is the uniform the girls need to start their journey to Instagram superstardom. Once prospective influencers have the right look, they have to get the pictures to let the world know that they have money. The girls stage Instagram posts stuffed full of glamorous places and luxury products. These things are essential tools to appearing like they're important people online. Obviously, heavy photoshopping is also done on the photos. In May of 2020, two Chinese influencers were caught doctoring photos to appear slimmer and more photogenic. Their throngs of fans felt betrayed and catfished, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. A lot of these girls are a gang of wannabe influencers fixed on perfecting the socialite con. While it might seem harmless to fake a jet set lifestyle, they're actually anything but because for a lot of these girls, it's to get rich husbands through smoke and mirrors. There are plenty of companies on Tabo, a WeChat e-commerce platform, that unabashedly help people to fake a lifestyle. They sell personalized voiceovers over videos of designer cars, mansions, epic tropical vacations, or big stacks of cash. Six yen, or roughly one dollar, is all that someone needs to fake out anyone on their Instagram. The turnaround time is nearly instantaneous, and the industry is booming. Fake socialites have another option at their disposal as well, counterfeit geotagging. You can pretend to have it all, including whirlwind trips to Bali, Dubai, or other luxury places with fake geotags. But not everything can be faked. Sometimes you actually gotta show up. But how can these girls actually afford the expensive hotel rooms in the exotic places along with all the designer handbags? The answer lies in strategic sharing. Strategic sharing is vital, especially if you actually are not rich. Also, the girls do need to look rich on a date and match what any prospective husband has seen on her Instagram. One of the golden rules of the young fashion money crowd is always to rent and never buy. The girls rent just about anything from luxury cars to on-demand services. They do it just so they can take a few photos to post and also to have the right look to impress the rich target at the same time. The other golden rule is that sharing is caring. The girls that look rich 
aren't actually rich. It's hard for them to justify spending a small fortune on designer purses and clothes, but becomes much more logical and attainable when they split the bill between many other girls. Chinese social climbers and aspiring Instagram stars oftentimes pool money to fake how much money they have. Take the example of a sophisticated brunch or a high tea at a five-star hotel. Instead of two people enjoying a high-priced meal, six girls chip in to offset the cost. The girls rotate through the pictures. Each girl will get her perfect picture with the spread, and the illusion becomes a reality, at least in the mind of the person looking at the picture. Do they all split the food when it comes time to eat too? Stuffing high-end hotel rooms to the gills with girls is another way these girls pull off their scam. For example, 15 to 20 girls will pack Shanghai's ritziest and most expensive hotel rooms. Each girl gets her ideal photo, and they're only out about 30 bucks each. It's a small price to pay to prop up the myth that they're wealthy in hopes that someday they really will be. Luxury cars are another popular item to rent. They make great backdrops for photos and are reasonably cheap if you split the cost between 60 girls. It's a better version of the old Taobao trick, but this time, instead of just a voiceover, you get to pose with a real car. The same goes for designer handbags and stockings. Instead of buying the expensive items, girls will rent and share them. There's somewhat of a strange honor system involved. They're fostered by a shared mission and sense of loyalty. After all, these clubs are relatively secretive and nobody will benefit from being outed as a fraud. Although this is great for the fake rich girls, it puts a massive strain on local businesses. They have to deal with dozens of girls sharing things that were never really meant to be shared. In August of 2020, a controversy erupted in the tabloids. The press revealed that Chinese superstars Wilbur Pan and Aaron Kwok were victims of a socialite con. Their wives were actually top graduates of a husband training camp run by a woman named Amy G. Photographs showed each woman sitting at an identical table, wearing the same clothes and eating the same bowl of fruit. Although G's photos were the only recent ones to surface, they're definitely not the only ones. As for duplicate images, as the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. She already knows that the photos got the job done for one girl, so why not have the same pose for another girl? The girls have to know how to pose and smile properly. So Xi had to give them the right instruction. Xi photos almost have their own look. She'll show the girls posing while ice skating, lying in a posh bed, or looking into the camera with identical ceramic smiles. Each photo is almost exactly the right balance between being sexy and approachable. The goal is for the girls to drip with sophistication and that she's not gold digging at all. Unlike the Tabao videos featuring huge stacks of money, Xi's looks actually don't scream well do whisper it. The whisper is the siren call designed to lure in the rich men who think that they're dating women of a similar social class. These images dupe many men into thinking that their Cinderella is a high-class socialite only to discover that it was a ruse all along after they put a ring on it. Although some people find deception on Instagram to be funny or frivolous, obviously lives are completely changed here. In fairness, these groups aren't just limited to China. The fake it till you make it crowd is a global phenomenon. These savvy wannabe influencers will employ every trick in the book to boost their image and become the next million dollar influencer. In the UK, influencers are turning to the allure of designer packaging to fake their wealth. It's known as the empty box phenomenon. Influencers will carry around empty bags and boxes from luxury brands such as Hermes and Prada to give the illusion that they shop there. This type of packaging is fantastic for photo shoots too, where what's in the box could be anyone's guess. Old school Photoshop tricks still do the job. Influencers will Photoshop themselves away in exotic locations and five-star adventures. In a world where perception is reality, these influencers can get hundreds of followers by appearing glamorous, even if they're not. These days, virtually anyone can operate Photoshop and create dreamy backdrops and fake vacation pics. TikTok has its own version of humble bragging known as the Falling Stars Challenge or Flaunt Your Wealth Challenge. In this challenge, social media stars get photographed taking a tumble with the luxury contents of their bags spilling out all around them. Other versions of the Falling Stars Challenge include influencers tumbling off private jets or falling in posh restaurants. Although it's a lot less subtle than the carefully cultivated Instagram photos designed to lure husbands, the Falling Stars Challenge is another branch of the same tree. 
the Falling Stars Challenge is popular with China's perfectly groomed Instagram elite, as well as Russia's rising Instagram stars, who also made waves for posing on fake jets. In the US, there are specific penthouses dedicated for the Instagrammers to rent out in LA. Then there are the companies that rent out private jets that just stay on the ground so pictures can be taken. Private jets are a gold mine for wannabe influencers who want to look rich. These companies will rent out private jets by the hour for less than 100 US dollars. They'll allow up to nine people to take private photographs. Is your favorite influencer taking private jets everywhere? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, most likely not. Although renting a jet for an afternoon photo shoot might seem harmless, it's still rooted in deceit. While the end goal might not be to snag a rich husband, the trickery and illusion are still there. Is this the main reason why Dan Bilzerian fakes his lifestyle? Find out in this video. The Instagram trend of smoke and mirrors is a global phenomenon that doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. No doubt the countless fake rich Chinese women will get more sophisticated in their cons. They'll still do whatever it takes to land a celebrity husband so they can completely change their life. There's no doubt that newer, glossier sleight of hand will be coming soon in the ever-evolving make-believe place that's called the internet. Here are the strange lives of a few of Germany's wealthiest citizens. Dieter Schwartz. Dieter Schwartz, known in the German press as the Phantom of Heilbronn, is one of the wealthiest human beings on earth, and yet very little is known about him. There are only a handful of images of him online, and even those are left up to speculation. Details about his personal life are tough to come by. Dieter owns the largest European retailer known as the Schwartz Group. Under the umbrella of his family's multinational retail group, Schwartz owns and operates two of Germany's most popular stores, the discount grocery store Lidl and the hypermarket chain Kaufland. Dieter oversaw the development of the first Lidl store back in 1973 after being inspired by his brothers Theo and Carl Albrecht and their creation of Aldi, another discount grocery store that has since become an international behemoth. Dieter hoped to replicate the success of the Albrecht's discount model and thus Lidl was born. When Dieter took full ownership of his family business following his father's death in 1977, he decided to spread the little love with the rest of the world, opening locations outside of Germany. Little now has more than 11,000 locations across 32 countries, including the US. Schwartz's other major brand, Kaufland, has more than 1,000 stores spread across eight European countries. With the mega success of the various companies he manages, Schwartz has become a very rich man. He is worth more than $30 billion. Good enough to place him among the 50th wealthiest people in the world. But why the cloak and dagger about his personal life. Several rumors exist about the Schwartz family, many of which are explored in an hour-long documentary called D. Little Story. While most of the gossip is outlandish and completely untrue, the filmmakers post one intriguing possibility in their doc as to why Schwartz stays so hidden from the public eye. Back in the 1970s, several high-profile Germans were kidnapped by a terrorist group called the Bader Meinhof Gang. One of the people taken was Schwartz's good buddy, Theo Albrecht, who was held captive for 17 days days and only released after paying a ransom of 7 million German marks. Could Schwartz be hiding out, fearing something similar might happen to him and his family? While we speculate, the Phantom of Heilbronn will be, very quietly, enjoying his billions. Suzanne Clatton not many people have heard of the heiress to the BMW throne. Suzanne Clatton, who inherited 12.5% of her father's company upon his death in 1982. Her father, Herbert Quant, a billionaire industrialist, saved BMW from bankruptcy back in the 1960s. Suzanne has since established her own legacy of savvy entrepreneurship and lives a secretive personal life. Suzanne is also the sole owner of the billion dollar pharmaceutical corporation, Altana, making her the richest woman in Germany with a net worth of $22.2 billion. But despite her riches, Suzanne is pretty shy. She tries to keep her personal affairs close to the vest. She was involved in a high profile scandal in 2007 after being blackmailed by a Swiss man claiming to have evidence of the two having an affair. He also built her for $10 million after fabricating a story about causing a tragic accident that involved the child of a scary mafia boss. Suzanne recorded conversations in which he blackmailed her, saying he'd release pictures of them 
together if she didn't give him more money. She agreed to meet and pay up, but she sent the police instead. The Swede was arrested along with his accomplice, who apparently filmed Clatton and her lover with a hidden camera during their secret rendezvous. Perhaps this very public humiliation was enough to compel Suzanne to go full hermit. Stories from earlier in her life imply she'd always kept quiet about herself. Even as she was courting her future husband, Jan Clatton, it's been said that she wasn't honest with him. She kept her real identity secret from him until they were thinking about getting married. At least that's how the story goes. She donned the alias of Susan Kant. However, her husband has since denied the story. How could someone not know that they were dating the richest woman in Germany? Suzanne has continued her bloodline's legacy of business excellence, but she's also continued her family's history of silence. The Quant Family even though they're to thank for saving BMW, the Quant family is not without their dark past. As it turns out, the Quants held secret ties to the Nazis during World War II and even used 50,000 slave laborers, many of whom passed away while working at the family's factories. An award-winning documentary called The Silence of the Quants aired back in 2008, exposing the secrets of the family's history. The doc created a newfound public curiosity in their personal lives. However, no modern time to Hitler's reign of terror have been made to living family members. The story dates back to Gunther Quant, patriarch of the Quant family, who joined the Nazi party in 1933, the same year Hitler came to power. He was put in charge of Germany's armaments economy and supplied weapons and ammo for the war effort. Those munitions were made in his factories, where he employed tens of thousands of slave laborers. After the war, Gunther was tried and ultimately found non-compliant in the war crimes of the Third Reich. He was released from prison in 1947 and died on vacation in Egypt in 1954. Since the Silence of the Quans documentary aired, modern family members tried to get in front of it, commissioning a 1,200-page review of their family history. The review confirmed everything the doc put forth. However, BMW was not implicated in any of it. The family does not deny the sins of their ancestors. Gabrielle Quant, Gunther's grandson, admitted his family had been wrong in trying to hide their past. Theo and Carl Albrecht Remember the Albrecht brothers, the German businessmen that we mentioned earlier? You know, the ones who were taken hostage by terrorists? Well, as it turns out, they weren't the only Theo and Carl Albrechts to make a lasting impact on the grocery store scene. You see, Theo and Carl both had sons who they named after themselves. So the second generation of Theo and Carl Albrechts came to be. Theo and Carl Jr. were first cousins and ran the retail empire they inherited from their fathers. Not only do the Albrechts own Aldi, which continues to be massive profitable with 6,500 locations worldwide, they also run another well-known grocery store chain, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's was bought by the Albrecht family in 1979. Theo and Carl Jr. are both very rich, just like their fathers, with two uber-successful supermarket chains to their names. The Albrecht cousins are worth a combined $35 billion, with Theo Jr. accounting for roughly $20 billion of that. Like their fathers before them, the German billionaires are extraordinarily private people. Neither of them make public appearances at store openings or company functions. They don't own vacation homes or travel the world on their private jets. They have chosen to live in seclusion with their families and their billions. Did the kidnapping of Theo's father back in the 70s contribute to the heir's decision to be so secretive? Adolf Merkel Adolf Merkel was born into a rich German family. By the time he was done building his pharmaceutical empire, he'd become one of Germany's richest people. Though he went to law school, Adolf was far more interested in being a businessman than being a lawyer. The biggest boon to his net worth would come in the early 90s. But before that, he made his riches in the pharmaceutical world by founding Ratio Farm, Germany's first generic drug brand. He also invested in other companies like Heidelberg Cement and Kassbohrer, a German car manufacturer that has since gone downhill. In 1994, however, Adolf started his most ambitious business venture when he took over his grandfather's wholesale chemical company and transformed it into Phoenix Pharma Handel, the biggest drug wholesaler in Germany that still regularly rakes in billions of dollars annually. Adolf quietly became one of the wealthiest people in Germany, though his aversion to the spotlight kept him out of the public eye for the most part. He lived with his wife and four children, running his very successful companies and neglecting to make any noise. That all changed 
changed in 2008, the financial crisis decimated his business empire. Desperate to stem the bleeding and recoup some of his losses, Adolf decided to short Volkswagen stock, betting $500 million against the German car company. The short sale was unsuccessful though, and Adolf lost all his money. Shortly after his failed bet, Adolf took his own life by jumping in front of an oncoming train. Wolfgang Marger. Wolfgang Marger has certainly made his presence felt in the world, even though not much is known about the man himself. In 1983, Wolfgang founded the pharmaceutical company Octopharma, which he has since grown into one of the leading manufacturers of blood plasma products around the globe. He continues to own and operate the lucrative corporation along with his children, two of whom sit on the company's board. In addition to his entrepreneurial pursuits, Wolfgang is a lifelong violinist having played since he was six years old. He even released his own album in 2011. He has made an effort to use the wealth he's accumulated to support the arts wherever possible. In 2008, he donated $17.5 million to help save the Heidelberg Theater, which was on the verge of closing at the time. The money was used to renovate the facilities and a newly built stage was named in Wolfgang's honor. He's also done his part to help children with blood disorders in underprivileged countries. He's sponsored a total of 70 kids with these diseases and used his company's resources to administer medical aid to these affected areas. He seems like a real stand-up guy, right? Wolfgang mostly keeps to himself, even with his various philanthropic endeavors, and very little information about his private life is known. Still, even as he keeps himself out of the headlines, he's been a force for good in the world. The Crown Casinos in Perth and Melbourne, Australia have played host to high-profile celebrities like Tom Cruise, Kim Kardashian, and One Direction. But the most important cog in Crown's well-oiled money machine is not its star-powered guest list. For years, the key to the whole operation was a little-known Chinese businessman named Tom Zhu. Nicknamed Mr. Chinatown, Zhu's ties to China's criminal underworld helped fuel Crown's rise to the top of the gambling world. All the while, Zhu was lining his own pockets in an elaborate elaborate money laundering scam sanctioned by the Chinese president himself. While Mr. Chinatown was the leader of Crown's secret scheme, two other major players were involved that are worth mentioning. Together, they make up the three-headed snake at the center of the story that the Chinese government doesn't want you to know about. One head is Ming Che, an influential figure within the Chinese Communist Party, who also happens to be President Xi Jinping's first cousin. Che followed closely behind his cousin as he climbed up the government totem pole, using his family connection to the future president to help bolster his career pursuits. Che's father was a high-ranking chief within China's armed police service. After serving as a police officer for a short while, Che shifted his efforts to telecommunications. He headed up multiple telecommunication firms in which the Chinese government held substantial stakes. As the years went on, it became evident to anyone paying attention that Che was up to no good with his business endeavors. He was able to successfully hide in plain sight thanks to his hookup in the president's office. He used his connections at the highest levels of Chinese politics to facilitate corrupt business deals for his shady partners. One of those partners was Simon Pan, another key member of the Crown Casino's aforementioned three-headed snake. Pan was the owner of an adult entertainment establishment located less than a mile from Crown's front doors. He and his business had been implicated in several court cases involving organized crime and alleged human trafficking. But even still, Pan was chumming it up with the likes of the president's cousin. Pan's place of work may not have been the most upstanding institution on the block, but its prime location right in Crown's backyard helped it become one of the casino's most vital business partners. Pan was responsible for luring high rollers to gamble at Crown. He was awarded a generous commission for his efforts, but that wasn't all. Pan legitimized his business operations by laundering the proceeds he made off of his adult entertainment gig through Crown's supposedly squeaky clean ledger. Pan helped supply the cash and catch the whales. Che ensured the Chinese government did not lay a finger on him and his buddies, and then there was Tom Zhu. What exactly was Mr. Chinatown's role in all of this? Zhu was the mastermind behind the whole operation. He was tasked with initiating the recruitment of the deep-pocketed high rollers who came and bankrolled the casino. His connection to the triads and organized crime syndicate made him a valuable asset to Crown. They were willing to take on dirty money and continually enable criminal practices to pursue their growth and development. The whole criminal enterprise is known as a junket. Junkets are a way for casino owners to 
get high rollers to come and play at their establishment. A junket operator is responsible for wooing these prolific gamblers, often by offering all expenses paid trips and other VIP perks. That's what Zoo did for Crown, although he would often delegate his work to sub junkets, assistants that would willingly do the rich and powerful Zoo's bidding. Since the Crown Casino was located in Australia, Zoo's junket was also a clean way for trads to launder money outside the eyes of the Chinese government. Traveling outside the country to gamble was a necessary precaution for these Chinese criminals to take. Ever since the Chinese Communist Party came to power in 1949, gambling has been outlawed. All forms of gambling are illegal under Chinese law. The same cannot be said for Australia, where gambling is 100% legal and 100% underregulated. Even though legislators are well aware that money launders abuse casino junkets, they've essentially given up trying to control what the casinos are doing. You wouldn't try to tame a hungry lion, would you? Of course not. That's why Australian regulators left the subject alone for years, allowing Zoo to carry out his illicit junket unchecked by the government. Gaming junkets are also legal in the United States. However, casinos must follow specific statutes to prevent the rampant criminality that you see in less regulated countries like Australia. The blueprint for laundering money through the Crown Casino was executed perfectly by Mr. Chinatown and his crackpot team of criminals and presidential family members. It all starts with the junket operator, in this case, Zoo, who recruits his precious high rollers to gamble at Crown. He then supplies them with a heaping help of casino chips to play with at various tables during their stay. This is how dirty money often enters the equation. As we learned earlier, Australian authorities couldn't be bothered to double check the source of the funds used to buy these chips. If a triad needs money laundered, there's no better place to start than a casino. They'll make even the dirtiest of cash spotless after it moves through their balance sheets. Crown cashes out the money that the gambler won or left unplayed. High rollers with criminal ties would now have a legitimate source for their previously filthy cash. Any debts that Zoo owed to his underworld connections would be paid off through the commission he earned from the casino for bringing the gamblers on board in the first place. Casinos and money laundering are like peanut butter and jelly. For as long as criminals have needed to launder money, they've used casinos to do just that, particularly in the less regulated regions of the world, such as Australia. In many cases, the high rollers Zoo lured from China required visas to enter Australia. While many of the individuals being brought over were linked to triads and other illicit organizations, Crown staffers were more than happy to vouch for them to visa officials. They ensured the Australian government that they fully trusted Tom Zhu's judgment, given their long-standing history with him. On many occasions, these high rollers were able to receive fast-tracked visas thanks to an emergency hotline that was set up between the Crown Casino and federal visa officials. If you're wondering what made Mr. Chinatown qualified to run such a sophisticated scam spread across multiple countries, let's just just say he'd had more than enough practice. Zhu was the subject of an Interpol red notice as a consequence of his prolific financial crimes. He laundered, defrauded, and extorted tens of millions of dollars while heading up his criminal empire. And he was an international fugitive because of it. He was supposed to be arrested if he ever crossed the border into another country, but that didn't happen when he fled to Australia. What or who was protecting him? It seems Zhu's loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party had given him a long legal leash. It certainly didn't hurt that he was powerful with the president's cousin. As part of the Crown Junkets operation, Ming Che promised to throw his political weight around to ensure Zhu would not be touched by the powers seeking to take him down for his crimes. Not only did he have friends in high places, but Zhu is also closely involved in a total of three organizations that heavily supported the Chinese Communist Party in Australia. Zhu's loyalty and support to the party were more important to Chinese law enforcement than bringing the mob boss to justice. Crown was not the only Australian casino taking advantage of the country's lax gambling laws. While they were certainly the first domino to fall, people started to catch wind of other casinos taking part in similar money laundering schemes. The Star Casino in Sydney was investigated in 2021 for apparently recruiting high rollers to clean up their cash on the casino floor, much like Zoo and his crown junket. The allegations against Star Entertainment were shocking to many, given the company's prominence within the gambling space. Australian authorities also began examining Sky City Entertainment, another gambling giant in the region. Executives at Sky City claimed they put an end to their association with Chinese high rollers once Crown's misdeeds were brought to light in 2019, and they agreed to cooperate with law enforcement's probe into their operations. Zhu was living large thanks to the fortune he was making off his Crown junket. Mr. Chinatown had so much money that he routinely dropped millions of dollars on luxury homes seemingly just for the heck of it. In 2009, he got himself
himself a mansion in Turok worth nearly $8 million. He bought another house around the corner a few years later for $15 million. But that was no skin off of the wealthy gangster's back. He splurged on yet another multi-million dollar property in central Victoria in 2016. Zoo came up with the idea to transform the expansive cattle farm into a five-star hotel for Chinese tourists. Those plans never materialized, however, and he instead turned it into a hunting lodge. Zhu didn't just indulge in opulent spending sprees. His wild lifestyle also involved recreational drugs and other unlawful vices. Mr. Chinatown's behavior became so erratic that he was even banned from Crown's casino grounds around 2016. He was still able to operate his criminal junket from afar thanks to his trusty sub-junkets who performed the hands-on duties he wasn't allowed to do himself. Zhu's good fortune eventually ran out. A data breach of Crown's servers resulted in sensitive emails being leaked to the public. On top of that, the authorities received a tip about a suspicious private flight at Kulangata Airport, which ultimately marked the beginning of the end for Mr. Chinatown. The leaked emails essentially spelled out many of the details regarding Crown's illegal junket operation. Tom Zhu, Ming Che, and Simon Pan were all implicated in the messages brought to light by the leak. The private flight in question was scheduled to take off on August the 17th, 2016. Federal police received an alert that a man suspected of taking part in a money laundering scam was preparing to board the private jet. That man was Tom Zhu. And while investigators knew little about the Chinese businessman, they knew something wasn't right. When police arrived at the scene and boarded the plane while it was idling on the runway, they searched the aircraft and its passengers for suspiciously large amounts of money, which might have indicated laundering. They didn't find the cash, and the plane was therefore allowed to take flight as planned. But there was something fishy about the people on that airplane. None of them were carrying cell phones or wallets, and that included Zhu and Che. When asked about the strange emissions from their luggage, one passenger claimed he had only decided to leave the country that morning on a whim. Not exactly the most convincing of explanations. These days, nobody even leaves their house without their phone, let alone the country. It's far more likely that Mr. Chinatown's guests were instructed to leave those particulars behind them, perhaps to avoid having their location tracked or being identified by the authorities. Avoiding detection was a particular interest to the high rollers who had just laundered money through Crown Casino and wanted to get out of Dodge as quickly and discreetly as possible. As federal investigators began piecing together the sprawling puzzle of Crown's junket scam, it became obvious that the whole operation was being supported not only by the Chinese government, but also by the richest man in Australia, James Packer. Packer is an investment mogul worth upwards of $6 billion. One of the blue chip investments in his portfolio just so happened to be Crown Resorts and Casinos. He dumped hundreds of millions of dollars into Crown and eventually became the company's majority shareholder. Packer subsequently became good friends with Tom Zhu. The junket operator was allowed unlimited access to private planes and luxury hotels. He was even gifted tickets for a concert put on by Packer's girlfriend, Mariah Carey. Crown's house of cards soon came tumbling down. Their illegal junket operations were found out as a result of the data leaks, and Zhu knew he was in big trouble because of it. He fled to Fiji, but was eventually arrested and deported back to China. What will happen to Mr. Chinatown now that he's back in his home country? No one knows for sure. Some have speculated that Zhu will be allowed to walk thanks to his deep-rooted triad connections and his involvement in pro-communist party organizations. The fate of the casino Zhu left behind in Australia is a little more cut and dry. James Packer was forced to step down as executive chairman. He had been closely involved with the company's junket services, and it's likely he knew what Zhu was doing. Crown Resorts itself was found unsuitable to hold a gambling license due to its ties to criminal triads in China. The worst part? They had just built a brand new multi-million dollar casino that they can no longer operate. They took a gamble on a little-known businessman from China with a questionable background. While Zhu ultimately helped make Crown a major player in the gambling industry, he also guaranteed their eventual downfall. It's unclear whether Crown will ever fully recover from the scandal. On the other hand, Zhu undoubtedly has enough friends in high places to help him land on his feet in no time. In Hangzhou, China, in May 2009, a wealthy 20-year-old named Hu Bin was drag racing with his Mitsubishi when he hit and fatally injured a pedestrian in the crosswalk. The victim came from a modest background and worked as a telecom engineer. Hu Bin was going so fast that the victim's body was hurled at least 20 yards. Hu Bin and his wealthy friends were photographed smoking cigarettes and laughing while waiting for police to arrive. Their disregard and insensitivity depicted in the tabloid photos provoked public outcry and spotlighted a case that mixed reckless 
reckless behavior with a potential police cover-up. Though the police later admitted to underestimating Hu Bin's driving speed, they reported a meager 43 miles per hour, which is not nearly enough to fling a body 20 yards. Hu Bin was only sentenced to jail for three years. Drunk drivers who cause similar damages may face the death penalty or life in prison. Further dismay arose when the man who arrived in court for sentencing wasn't even Hu Bin, but a body double instead. Hiring a body double to stand in for wealthy crime suspects is not uncommon in China. In fact, the practice even has its own name, Ding Shui. Ding means substitute, and Shui means crime, which translates to substitute criminal. Though not legal, it is also not investigated by police, probably due to bribery and coercion from wealthy offenders. Though China is a communist country that, in theory, seeks equal socioeconomic status among its citizens, Ding Shui is an example of how economic inequality stains the nation and manifests in the justice system. China's wealthiest people can get away with murder, literally. In 2009, a wealthy man who caused a fatal car accident hired his employee's father to confess and serve out his sentence. In another incident, a man caught driving a motorcycle without a license hired a stand-in for $8,000. Another time, a demolition company owner who illegally demolished a home hired a poor man to serve as his body double in jail and promised $31 for each day he spent behind bars. The poorest of the poor are often willing to suffer consequences on behalf of the wealthy as a way to honor their family and escape poverty. According to the 2021 Forbes annual rich list, Beijing, the capital of China, now has the most billionaires compared to every other city in the world. Between 2020 and 2021, the city added 33 more billionaires to its population, with a running total of 100 and growing. New York City had housed the most billionaires for the past seven years and narrowly lost with 99 billionaires compared to Beijing's 100. China added 210 billionaires total in its population last year, including Hong Kong and Macau. Nearly half of these individuals made their money in the technology sector, which grew exponentially out of the pandemic. Compared to Western countries, China could contain the spread of COVID-19 relatively quickly, with government-mandated lockdowns that forced people to go online for shopping and entertainment. As a result, tech giants infinitely increased their reach and wealth. Beijing's wealthiest man in 2021 was Zhang Yiming, the founder of TikTok and CEO of its parent company, ByteDance, with a net worth of $35.6 billion. The gap between the richest rich and the poorest poor continues to grow. While protesters in the U.S. target the wealthiest 1%, China's wealthiest 0.01% controls nearly half of the country's capital. This upper tier of China's richest citizens is mostly the children of relatives of China's past rulers and dynasties. Now, they collaborate to pool all wealth and power amongst themselves in an increasingly concentrated portion of the population. They have also been known to coerce police into shockingly short jail sentences. China is known for its limitation of free speech. Still, as this corruption continues to make headlines, lower-class citizens seem more willing to sacrifice their honor and status to decry the unfairness and inequality. For as long as Westerners have been going to China, they have reported this body-double phenomenon. Various missionaries, scholars, and travelers noticed it as an oddity of the country's legal system, which has continued into the present. In 1848, the going rate for a substitute was 17 pounds, or about 2,000 US dollars in today's economy. Criminals would have to wear cane, a device used for public humiliation. It was a large square of paneled wood that had a hole in the middle for an individual's head. It was often paired with a chain around the person's neck to keep them from moving from their spot. The Kang restricted people's movements to such an extent that it caused some to starve because they couldn't feed themselves. In 1895, George McKay, a missionary to Taiwan, witnessed the body doubles and the wrongful mistreatment they went through. He said it was an open secret that these men had nothing to do with the case but were bribed to wear the Kang for six weeks. In 1899, a scholar of Chinese criminal law said that the courts openly allowed offenders to hire substitutes and that this practice would likely continue for the foreseeable future. He was right. The wealthy can even hire stand-ins for capital punishments. They would be promised food and wealth for their starving families in exchange for taking on another person's crime. It was viewed as highly honorable to sacrifice oneself for their family's prosperity. Sacrifice was seen as a lesser evil than poverty. 
Some Chinese law officials even justified the practice, arguing that the real criminal was responsible for paying a hefty fee to the substitute and thus paid the market value for his crime. In turn, the stand-in's punishment would serve as a warning for other criminals and thus keep the crime rate low. Others argued that it simply encouraged the wealthy to engage in crime. Under this pretense, they could get away with it by hiring a poor person to face the consequences. China has a long history with these body doubles. In an interview with Slate, one Chinese police officer admitted to the existence of replacement convicts, saying that while law presides over wrongdoing in America, the people preside over crime in China. Therefore, the people hold the power to dole out punishment. When the wealthiest are in charge and the offenders, justice is rarely served. This practice of stand-in suspects has long taken place for China's mafia, when mafia bosses would get caught and their subordinates would serve time on their behalf. The substitute convict would be compensated for their time served, with money and the knowledge that the mafia was looking out for their family. The practice of Ding Shui even occurs among the non-wealthy, especially in vehicle accidents, when the driver escapes the scene before being identified. Therefore, anyone can stand in as the suspect. In one case in which a drunk driver hit an older man, the driver's son confessed to the crime to prevent the police from testing his father's blood alcohol levels. In another case in which the deputy director of Xiongshang Forest Bureau was involved in a hit and run, he sent his wife to confess to the crime to avoid risking his career. To minimize the sentence, the suspect is sometimes swapped for a more sympathetic person, perhaps a family member or friend who is younger, sober, licensed, and insured. But in the digital age, when photos of the subject are quickly snapped and circulated, more believable body doubles need to be hired, thus allowing these replacement convicts to become exclusive among China's very rich. Known for its extreme communism, China also veers towards capitalism in surprising ways. It is a newly industrialized country with a growing GDP powered by its vast exports. But as the country's wealth increases, so does its rural urban income disparity. The National Bureau of Statistics of China reports urbanites earning 3.33 times more than their farming counterparts. In 2014, the disparity became severe when 1% of the population officially owned more than one-third of the country's wealth. It has since gotten worse, with 0.01% of the population owning more than half of the country's wealth. The inequality present in China is due to various factors, including policies biased towards urban and coastal environments, unequal access to education, and demographic changes as the older population passes away and the effects of the one-child policy of 1979 linger. Economists warn that unless the government acts, these disparities will continue to grow and could even threaten the nation's stability. In 2012, Gu Kailai, a Chinese businesswoman, lawyer, and wife of a prominent Chinese politician, was convicted for the death of British businessman Neil Haywood. She became involved in a national scandal when her husband's deputy, Wang Lijong, sought refuge at the U.S. office in Chengdu, China. Supposedly, Wang possessed evidence of a corruption case where Gu's husband attempted to halt an investigation against her. Wang stated that this case had to do with a business dispute. British businessman Neil Haywood demanded $22 million from Gu after a failed business venture and even threatened her son. Haywood was later found unresponsive under mysterious circumstances. Wang alleged that Gu got him drunk on whiskey and tea, then poured animal poison in his mouth. She placed pills next to him to look like an overdose. Investigators opened the case into Gu. As a result, her husband lost his prominent position in the Communist Party. In 2012, Gu was officially charged with the passing of Haywood and publicly admitted wrongdoing. She received a suspended life sentence, which was commuted to life in prison after two years. She did not contest the charges. However, after media footage of the trial was released, intense public outcry ensued, with people alleging that the woman in the video was not Gu at all. It was a body double. This was emphasized by her political ties as the wife of a corrupt Chinese politician known for embezzlement and bribery. The Chinese government attempted to censor such content, which raised more suspicion from the UK and US. The Chinese Communist Party and facial recognition experts argued that Gu was the woman who stood trial. But the prominent practice of Ding Shui in China means that these promises are not guaranteed. This brings us back to the case of Hu Bin, the rich 20-year-old man who took someone's life while drag racing in his Mitsubishi. While someone convicted of manslaughter may face life imprisonment, Hu Bin only got three years in jail, if this was Hu Bin at all. 
Comparison photos between the court case and the crime scene show two suspects that look markedly different from one another. The photos show two men who have vastly different physical and facial features, including body weight and distance between the eyebrows. An internet survey showed that 98.5% of people believed Hu Bin hired a body double. Judicial authorities countered, arguing that Hu Bin's family only possessed moderate wealth and could not have afforded a stand-in. 2012 was the end of Hu Bin's three-year sentence. Someone walked out of that prison a free man, but whether it was really Hu Bin, the world may never know. Saturday, November 4, 2017, was an average day at the Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Nothing was out of the ordinary, so nothing could prepare the country for what came next. Many guests were in town for business, while others were checking out the beautiful five-star hotel when everything went on lockdown out of nowhere. At about 11 p.m., guests were summoned to the hotel lobby. Staff instructed them to pack up and bring their bags if they were there on business. They couldn't leave anything behind because they wouldn't be coming back. Instead, they'd be moved to another hotel. If the people were visiting, the police swiftly escorted them out. There were no exceptions and zero explanations. These guests didn't know how lucky they were as they were being whisked away to other accommodations. As for the people checking in over the next few days, well, they wouldn't be as lucky. In fact, they were in for a terrible surprise. The Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh was turned into a prison by the Prince of Saudi Arabia. Soon, the rooms were filled by the who's who of Saudi Arabian royalty and business elite. There were many familiar faces among the guests turned prisoners. They all wondered why they were there, and more importantly, when they could leave. The answer wouldn't be that simple. It turns out that King Salman and his son and heir Mohammed bin Salman, let's call him MBS, ordered their arrest. The motive behind this bold move depends on who you ask. Some people called it consolidation of power, while others called it a power struggle. In the end, MBS came out on top. Many princes, current ministers, and Saudi government officials were detained at the Ritz-Carlton. These were high-ranking, well-connected, and powerful men who held high positions of power within Saudi culture and government. In an instant, they were fired and replaced with new officials, surprising many across the country and the world. It shouldn't have been, though. Those who were newly appointed were all MBS supporters. The king and MBS claimed the entire spectacle was to fight decades-long corruption, but others were more suspicious. They smelt ulterior motives. Perhaps these moves will make it easier for MBS to assume control as the future king after his father's death. The pair laid the groundwork for this back in June 2017, when there was a reshuffle of royalty. The king kicked out his nephew as crown prince and named MBS his new successor. While some were shocked, signs of this power shift had been evident for years. The former crown prince had been removed from critical decisions and sidelined during diplomatic events in favor of MBS, including meetings with former U.S. President Donald Trump. In hindsight, that reshuffle and mass imprisonment sent a clear sign. MBS told the country and the world not to mess with him. The power consolidation was in full swing, and it wouldn't stop there. MBS said the imprisonment would combat corruption in Saudi Arabian business and politics. The kingdom claimed they found at least $100 billion had been misused for decades. That included both systemic corruption and embezzlement from inside and outside the government. MBS wanted to hold everyone who played a part accountable. He promised to make changes in the established order in Saudi Arabia, and this was his first step. But he couldn't start by just throwing influential people in jail. That would be a nasty look. It could be culturally damaging and insulting, leading to steep consequences that could potentially break the ties that bind Saudi society together. That wouldn't do, so instead, he booked them in one of the most affluent hotels in the world. The Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh is a luxury five-star hotel with royal suites, a men's-only spa, 52 acres of gardens, fancy restaurants, and more. U.S. presidents and other world leaders have stayed there. It's among the best of the best, even after being converted to a temporary prison. MBS cut off all communication once everyone was in their cells. His prisoners could not contact the outside world. All the rooms were booked, and nobody was allowed in or out. 
They were there until they reached an agreement with MBS, though at the time, they didn't know what that agreement would look like. MBS eventually released his prisoners, but not until they paid hefty financial settlements. No one other than MBS knows how much they all paid, but nobody moved until they emptied their wallets. He accused every prisoner of misusing funds over the years. To him, it was only fair they paid it all back, whether the accusations were true or not. As a result, most were stripped of their power, including the former king's son. He was fired from his role as head of the National Guard. Even though the prisoners were in a luxury hotel, they didn't have a luxury experience. Anonymous sources reported they were coerced into things they didn't want to do or say. Guards roughed them up to get the results MBS wanted. Many of the prisoners were sleep deprived. Some were hurt so badly that they had to be hospitalized after their imprisonment. One former general, even passed away. They never offered an official explanation of what happened to him, but it's likely the result of his treatment during imprisonment. MBS and his people denied the harsh treatment and refused to comment further on the imprisonment. What happened at the Ritz-Carlton will remain a secret between those who were there voluntarily and those held against their will. The end result was the same. MBS consolidated power. The Ritz wasn't the only hotel holding prisoners during this time. They housed more people at the Courtyard by Marion a nearby hotel in Riyadh's diplomatic quarter when the Ritz filled up. These rooms were not nearly as nice. It was only a four-star hotel. But it was good enough to house those MBS accused of corruption. But you would never know it was a secondary holding place for prisoners if you asked the hotel. The receptionist played dumb when questioned by reporters. She said she didn't know about the high-profile prisoners and didn't comment on any of the people arriving at the hotel in the last few days. Whether they voluntarily checked in or not, guest privacy was of the utmost concern. Regardless of the reasoning, the Marriott Hotel, like the Ritz, was completely booked through December 1, 2017 and they were not taking new reservations. Anyone staying there had to leave and find new accommodations, and any existing reservations were canceled. Precisely what happened at the Ritz. Public imprisonment wasn't the only thing MBS was doing to weed out his enemies during his rise to power. At the same time, he'd established a group of dangerous men called the Tiger Squad. They were 50 of the most dangerous people in Saudi Arabia, pulled from the Secret Service and the military. Each brought a series of unique skills meant for one purpose, to take out dissenters against the Crown and MBS. Their methods were more subtle than others. They didn't overtly take down their targets. No, it was much more sinister than that. Instead, they staged house fires, car accidents, plane crashes, and poisonings. Everything they did came with a plausible explanation. It all looked like an accident. The Tiger Squad didn't want to draw attention to the purge. They simply wanted to silence those deemed as dissenters. That included journalist Jamal Khashoggi, taken out by the Tiger Squad. Jamal went to the Saudi consulate in Turkey to get papers he needed to get married. Instead of documentation, he was met with 15 men who quickly took his life. Enemies of MBS and the Crown were dealt with swiftly, though the severity varied based on their power, position, and wealth. Now, not all who got arrested in Saudi Arabia faced the same five-star treatment. The government reserves those privileges to the most important people. If an American gets arrested, they could face more severe and harsh punishments. The laws are much different in Saudi Arabia, and you may not even know you're breaking one. Regardless, you'll face serious repercussions. You could be expelled from the country, arrested, imprisoned, or even executed as a result. For example, if they catch you importing, manufacturing, possessing, or consuming alcohol or illegal drugs, you could be jailed, fined, flogged publicly, or deported. If you're caught trafficking substances, the sentence is capital punishment, with no exceptions. There are U.S. embassies in Saudi Arabia, but they don't have any standing in courts to plead for leniency. If you do something, you're on your own. The U.S. embassy can't get you out of jail, provide representation, pay for fees, or serve as an interpreter. Instead, the embassy can connect you with representatives that speak English or your preferred language, give you information, obtain medical care, and notify your family of what's happening. All fees and penalties are your responsibility. It's in every person's best interest to become familiar with the local laws before visiting Saudi Arabia. Ignorance is not a defense. And if you get detained, always ask that they notify the U.S. Embassy on your behalf. They won't always do this for you, so it's your responsibility to seek help. MBS has been on a mission to reform Saudi Arabia's image, and they invested $64 billion to do so. They began by inviting top musicians like Mariah Carey, Janet Jackson, and Sean Paul to look more fun and inviting. 
They want to attract Western attention in a good way, and they're sparing no expense to do so. It's not just about entertainment, either. Under NBS, they've ended bans on women driving, mixed-gender concerts, and cinema. They want to increase domestic spending because oil prices have been declining, which is the country's biggest industry. They're attempting to appear more progressive, no matter how small the steps they're taking. But some claim it's all smoke and mirrors. These actions only distract people from the more serious things going on in the country. Anyone who criticizes MBS appears to go missing. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. Scholars, activists, economists, journalists, and so many more have all been put behind bars for speaking their truths. MBS is the future of Saudi Arabia. Regardless of whether or not you believe in what he's doing, you need to fall in line or face the consequences. And those consequences will be steep. Just don't expect to be put up in the Ritz-Carlton. That's reserved for the ultra-rich and powerful. Futuri is a Chinese term to describe the children of the uber-rich, particularly those who extravagantly flaunt their family's wealth in overt and pretentious ways. Although it may sound similar to the Kardashians, the Futuri are on a whole other level. The word Futuri means rich second generation, born into wealth and inheriting fortunes from their parents' billionaire businesses. The main difference between the Futuri and their parents is that most of these kids have no idea what it means to work hard, let alone realize the true worth of money. The result? A generation that thinks it's cool to buy their dog eight iPhones for social media clout. So what's it like being a crazy rich Asian today? Is it cool as it sounds? Or is it a bubble that is soon to burst? The People's Republic of China fell in 1949, paving the way for the Chinese Communist Party to rise. The CCP introduced the Laogai prison system, a prison camp for those who opened their mouths against the government. Anyone who expressed opposition to the communist government or practiced any religion banned by the ruling party was immediately put behind bars. Transforming from a People's Republic to a hardcore communist country wasn't easy to swallow. People's movements were controlled. The government and the ruling class acquired all the personal wealth, and no one could possess or achieve private wealth outside of the government. After decades of oppression, things started to change. When Mao Zedong died, Ding Xiaoping came to power, although Deng was also a communist leader. His version of communism was more inclusive than Mao Zedong, resulting in a revolutionized Chinese economy. Among some of the most crucial steps taken, Ding opened China to the global market. Previously, China was isolated from the rest of the world due to extreme economic and political stances. But soon after Ding took over, economic growth boomed. Ding's government allowed some of their people to become rich. People started to do business worldwide. Businesses grew like crazy and people were becoming more prosperous than ever in the history of China. An entirely new demographic emerged in China, known as the Nouveau Riche, or New Money. Today, China has more than 800 billionaires, and Beijing has more billionaires than any city in the world. In the 80s and 90s, these wealthy elite couples started families. At that time, China had a one-child rule, so parents weren't allowed to have more than one baby. That meant that there would be only one successor to inherit their parents' business and fortune. This was the beginning of the Futuri generation. Fast forward to the 2010s, and these rich kids are all grown up. They built a reputation for themselves by spending their parents' wealth in every imaginable way. In addition to spending their parents' money, they flaunt their wealth and lifestyle on social media. They were spending thousands of dollars on luxury vacations, supercars, and extravagant nights out on the town. This generation of wealth revolves around showing off. They want people to know they are rich, and social media is their avenue to show off. Futuri kids use platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook to flaunt lavish lifestyles. However, these extravagant lifestyles are funded by decades of hard work earned off the backs of their parents. In one viral example, a Futuri kid is seen setting money on fire on social media. She wanted to make sure people understand that she has tons of money to literally burn. This is just one of the thousands of weird and crazy things the Futuri kids are doing with their parents' money. But are the Futuri the only ones to blame for their seemingly uncontrolled lifestyle? The question is difficult to answer if the westbound mentality of their parents is considered. 
It's common and almost expected for the nouveau parents to send their kids to the U.S. to get a high school or college education. This is the stepping stone for those second-generation Chinese who eventually settle in the country for a few reasons. Because of their fortune, it's easy for the parents to get visas for their children to come to the United States. One of the most attractive qualities of the West is the ability to own land and property. In China, you are not allowed to own land outright. Instead, you can lease the land from the government for a period of 70 years. This makes it hard to accumulate generational wealth, especially as the value of land goes up and down. That's why most of these billionaires are investing in the West. It's a safety net to ensure their future generations can have a wealthy life outside of China. Even Xi Mingzi, the daughter of the current CCP president, Xi Jinping, went to Harvard for her graduate degree. Although she did keep a low profile and made sure not to expose herself to the public, she graduated from Harvard in 2014. Thousands of students like Xi Mingzi now live in cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Boston, keeping a low profile and receiving regular education. According to one study, more than 230,000 students from mainland China are studying in the U.S. high schools and colleges. Considering there are 1.4 billion people in China, this number is restricted to the wealthy elite. But is it only to get settled in the United States? Not for all. Some of the futuri in the U.S. today think differently than others. Having a Western education, speaking English, and sounding more American is a position of status, says Nathaniel Rio, a then 22-year-old futuri YouTuber also known as Cash Fleazy. Now in his 30s, he's changed his outlook on life and how he spends his parents' cash. In one of his YouTube videos, he explained how he couldn't wrap his head around his parents' legacy, a legacy that will soon be his. His spending habits had no purpose except to show off his money online. He looked back at his old Instagram photos where he was consistently seen on expensive vacations. He would brag and flaunt the wealth he got from his father. People did remind him in the comments that he is wasting money earned by his dad, but it took more than 10 years for him to understand the nature of his actions. Some futuri don't fit the mold, like Guan Guan. His father owns a successful advertising agency and his mother deals in antiques. While Guan gets lumped in with the rest of his futuri generation, he insists that he's nothing like them. Guan claims to have an alcohol allergy and has no interest in nightclubs or karaoke bars. Guan has surrounded himself with like-minded futuri and believes the big spenders he sees on social media exist due to their parents. Long work hours and business trips left little time for those parents to spend with their children. As a result, the kids grow up without learning respect for others or how to manage money. Like Nathaniel, countless futuri kids were seen burning through thousands of dollars for literally no reason. In 2016, Wang Sekong, the son of China's richest man, Wang Jianlin, spent 350,000 euros in one night at a karaoke bar in Beijing. The news made headlines and people didn't like what they saw. Critics said it was as ridiculous as the girl who was seen burning bills on screen. When Wang isn't spending money on himself or his friends at karaoke, he's spending it on his dog Kiki. Two social media posts sparked outrage among the anti-futuri community when Wang showed off his Husky's golden Apple watches worth $20,000 each. Yes, that's watches plural, one for each front paw. In a similar but unrelated post, Kiki the Husky is seen with eight iPhones. The photo appeared on Kiki's Weibo page, a page with 1.9 million subscribers. According to the bar managers in Beijing, Futuri kids will book a private table for as much as $5,000 just to sit around and brag about their possessions. They were seen in these Beijing clubs discussing the latest supercars, which expensive brands they were wearing, and stories of their extravagant trips. According to a recent BBC report, Beijing has more billionaires than any other city in the world. Beijing has the highest number of billionaires in a country where the average annual income is about $5,000 per year. As the years pass, people are less impressed by this ultra-unreal spending. The Futuri generation has found different ways to flaunt and brag about their riches, as people in medieval times used to get fat to indicate that they have more food than the others. Rich Chinese kids are now showing off their wealth more subtly. To illustrate, 
An Instagram influencer named Ming Kuiji77 on an Instagram post complained that she couldn't find enough charging stations around the neighborhood for her Tesla. She didn't brag that she owns a Tesla, but we all get it, don't we? This is how these rich people are showing off when their audience is reacting negatively. It's known as the art of the humble brag. <laughs> yes, you got it. The humble way to brag. Futuri kids are growing up both in age and maturity. They hit their 30s and responsibility comes knocking. Things are changing for them, and they're changing fast. Most of these kids are the only children their parents have, and inevitably, they have to take over the family business. Even if some of these kids choose not to run the family business, they still have to choose a career. Even billionaires have to work regularly to maintain their wealth and status. Unfortunately, some of the Futuri have to hit rock bottom before they can make a change. Reality hits, and it hits hard. The emptiness of needless spending becomes evident, and they realize it is time to work. In addition, the general public has a growing resentment towards the Futuri. Thanks to the continuous news headlines and social media posts, more and more people are critically evaluating the lavish life these rich kids are leading online. Is it because regular people are jealous of their lifestyle? Well, maybe, but this is working as a reality check for most of these kids. This is forcing them to stop this crazy spending spree and get serious about their life. As COVID-19 rocked the world in 2020, the question is more relevant than ever. Is it cool anymore to be a crazy rich Asian kid? For the general population, it's not a thing anymore, which is visible in their social media comments. But the most difficult question to answer is reserved for the nouveau riche parents. Are their kids even ready to take over their business? The question remains a mystery, as no one knows what these Chinese billionaires are planning to do with their business. Are they going to hand over the company to their unqualified futurized children? Or will they simply sell the company and force their kids to build something for themselves? The richest billionaire in China, Wang Jianlin, is undoubtedly not going to crown his son with his billion-dollar business. He plans to give his entire empire away and build up the Chinese soccer team in the future. Stories like Wang Jianlin are a wake-up call for the Futurai kids who have never had to work in their lives until now. It's not cool to be a crazy rich Asian kid anymore. Click to watch one of these next videos.